Fire away. Fire away. I know you got first year guys who'll join the program in, in May or June. Are you, once that group comes on board, do you have the roster you're going to take into next season or do you need to augment it a little more? Yeah, great question. I think that uh, with where we are in college football and, um, you know, we fought hard uh, down the stretch trying to sign some, some more high school guys uh, here to, to fill a couple needs and weren't able to uh, close on those and, um, you know, some intense battles. And, uh, but we got to still got a couple spots we got to fill. And we also just didn't want to take uh, placeholders. We wanted to make sure that we had guys that fit. So we know there's another window that's going to open up um, after the spring. So I would imagine, you know, with that, and then by the time that closes, then we'll welcome in the first years. Uh, and that should be the roster uh, that we're going, going to battle with. But I anticipate after spring, uh, obviously, this day and age in college football, don't want to have any attrition. Uh, so I'm, I'm knocking on wood that we won't have any attrition, but I also know that there are a couple more spots where we have some needs that we weren't able to fill uh, just because of how things transpired uh, at the end of the season and through recruiting, uh, in particular offensive line-wise with the transition there with, uh, uh, with the coaching change and then a couple guys jumping into the portal. And, and we were able to, uh, obviously, we talked about Uganda a second ago. We were able to get Uganda, but we still have a couple more uh, spots that we want to uh, fill. And then also with Terry coming on board, wanted to make sure uh, that we didn't, we didn't rush and do things that, that weren't in line with what he uh, was looking for from the position group. And then maybe another corner uh, and a safety uh, down the stretch to, to complete our 85 scholarship. And uh, then we'll add the, uh, the first years. After the early signing day, you said you wanted to reinforce the secondary. You were able to get Tavon and Cam. What kind of stood out about them? And talk a little bit about their recruitment. Yeah, so, so Cam was a guy. And it's, and it's amazing. I, I remember talking to him and his mom uh, as we were, were coming in on uh, solidifying the deal uh, with him coming here. Uh, it comes full circle. You know, he was a guy that was highly recruited here uh, the first time around, being from, from down at the beach area. Um, and it just worked out that, that this time go around. But what stands out about Cam is, is first and foremost, just the type of young man that he is. A high character kid, um, really, really good worker. Uh, was excited about the opportunity to come uh, back to Virginia. So I think it kind of came full circle for him. And, you know, he's a big guy uh, in the secondary. He's about 6'2", 200 plus pounds. And, uh, has played in the ACC. Um, you had a lot of snaps at, uh, at UNC. So excited about uh, adding him. And then, you know, Tavon's a guy that shows you some versatility, can play uh, the nickel spot, can also play corner. And uh, again, going in, we didn't, prior to the, to the end of the season, we didn't an, uh, anticipate as much attrition at the co uh, corner spot. Uh, so we had to go replace a guy, uh, but then also a guy that gives you some versatility that can play uh, as a nickel, uh, obviously, uh, obviously helps. And both of them, so far, it's been fun to watch those guys because uh, you're always nervous uh, about older guys coming into a locker room. And our locker room is different than most places, you know, considering, you know, where we, where we are uh, and what we've been through. Uh, but to see those guys come in and just immediately mesh with the guys, uh, it's been fun to watch. Tony, what, what was the, the process or the emotion of getting back to work after everything you guys went through? and? You know, that first day that you realize I've still got a job to do, I've got a depth <laughs> chart, I've got a... How hard or, or awkward was that process? You know, for the coaches, uh, it never really stopped, you know, for us. Uh, I think that, that we, live, we live at such a fast pace uh, that we're always going, and so our minds never shut off. But I was, I was, um, I was I wouldn't say nervous, but I, I had a lot of, uh, of thought uh, about our players when they came back because it was a break of about 30 days for them. And so you were a little bit nervous about how are they going to come back. But I tell you what, they've come back with a great spirit, um, you know, a, a renewed spirit. Uh, we had to address what we had to address, the, the first team meeting. Uh, obviously, uh, we're still in a space where we're, 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 we're not moving on, we're moving forward. And we're moving forward with, you know, what has transpired uh, within our program. But to see the guys, the way that they're working, um, you, know, you notice the attention to detail uh, has, a, has a heightened sense of urgency uh, related to that. Our accountability, just the way we're tracking things, you're starting to see guys uh, with some more buy-in. Uh, so it's really been refreshing and encouraging to me as a, as a coach uh, when the young people come back uh, with that because obviously they're, they're at ground level. 
you know, they're in it. And, and so to see those guys come back uh, refreshed and then the influx of the new guys, uh, I think it's been a good blend. Uh, you know, their, their eagerness, their, their hungerness, I mean, their hunger to, to get going has really, really blended with the guys' renewed spirit to kind of um, get back together and get back to work. So it's actually been, been really refreshing and positive. Uh-oh. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> word for word. That's the transcript. Uh, Coach, obviously you lost uh, Mark, Coach Higgins. Yeah. You know, just conversations with him, what were those like, and then going through the process of replacing him? Yeah. Um, so first and foremost, excited uh, for Marcus and his new opportunity, and uh, very, very grateful for, for his service uh, to the institution and also the impact that he made in the community. He and his wife, Lauren, uh, were instrumental for years not just in Virginia football, but in the Charlottesville area. So very, very appreciative of, of an opportunity to be around them. And I became a better person, you know, being around Marcus and just the quality individual that he is and the way that he lives his life. And, you know, the conversation is, is probably similar to the conversations that I had when I was at Clemson for 11 years. Uh, obviously, uh, he's been here for a long time, and, and he's seen a lot of different things and experienced a lot of different things. And the uh, biggest conversation was for him, it was about an opportunity to grow, you know, outside of this environment to be able to, to, to accept a new challenge. Uh, so that was the, the crux of the conversation. I definitely uh, did not want to see uh, Marcus leave. Um, and I was excited about the opportunity for, for us to work together going forward. But I also understood, you know, where he was coming from and has an opportunity to be reunited with a person that's very, very close to him. Uh, so there were a lot of factors, uh, and he went through it the right way and processed it the right way. And, and at the end of the day, um, you know, you trust that, that, that he believed this was the best decision for him in his career uh, moving forward, but definitely uh, did not want to see him go. Uh, but at the same time, too, I understood uh, where he was at because I, I was there for, at my alma mater for, for 11 years. And you want to see if you can grow. And so this is an opportunity for him to do that and to replace him. You know, I thought about it long and hard, um, and, and obviously Adam played for me, and, and I coached him, but he also had a year uh, to work alongside Marcus as well, and so he had relationships with the guys that were on the roster. He was a part of the process of recruiting the guys uh, that we brought in alongside with Marcus, and so uh, for me, with, with that position uh, and the transition, uh, it made the most sense uh, to stay in-house uh, as opposed to looking at the offensive line situation. Um, you know, I had guys in-house. Uh, but also had a lot of youth uh, on that uh, on that, at that position, and so it was a little bit different uh, approach uh, on the offensive line. Uh, but for the receiver position, it was a familiarity with Adam, having coached him. But then also he had been around the guys and been a part of 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 what Marcus had done for a year to help ease that transition. From day one when you got here, you said you wanted to build up the running game and have a more yeah. balanced attack. Given Coach Heffernan's background at Stanford, which you know took a lot of pride in running the ball, how do you think that'll kind of impact that process? Well, I thought we we were starting to make progress, uh, you know, prior to him coming. I think philosophically, uh, more so than anything, just a mindset of wanting to be balanced, and then his experience coming from uh, you know that run game aspect with uh, Stanford. Um, uh, is really going to help, and also his experience in the NFL. But I also, uh, in, in, in the interview process, had a chance to talk about pass protection and things of that nature. And I think he's got uh, a wealth of experience in that in that area. And also, I, I want to run the football, but you got to be balanced, especially in this league. So I think it's a it's a good mix all the way around from the run game and from the uh, the passing game. And you know, the good thing about that position in particular at running back is that we got everybody back. And we added uh, Kobe uh, in the uh, in the first signing, so we got healthy competition, uh, which is always going to improve the performance of the running backs. And then uh, with the young guys, we have an opportunity to build from the ground up, uh, especially with uh, with Coach Heff and his background. Tony, you're, you're going into another spring, then your second season at Virginia, second season as a head coach. Yeah. What are some things from year one that um, I don't know? Either you thought, wow, that was easier than I thought, harder than I thought. <laughs> I want to do that different. I wasn't ready. I, you, you felt good about it. Right. What are some kind of reflections off year one as, as you get ready for year two? Yeah, so the first uh, part of, of what you said, there wasn't anything easier uh, than, I, than I thought, uh, to, to be honest with you, in year one. Um, you know, I, I thought 
that that the separation um, from the I guess from the from the day to day football piece of it, the game planning would be a little bit little bit different. Uh, but I didn't know it was going to be as drastic and as quick, uh, just because you got so many other things that come across your desk. Also, uh, I think that as a head coach, uh, I learned that it's different than being an assistant, right? I think I think as an assistant, you know, there's there's certain you know times and well, actually, I'd say it like this: when you're assistant, you're with your guys every single day. You know their body language. You know what buttons you can push. As a head coach, you're trying to do that for an entire team and it's a little bit different. So I learned that that my approach as a head coach, you know, I have to to evaluate that uh, and make sure that that I understand from the head coach's seat, um, you know, what buttons you can push, what buttons you can't push. And that's different than being an assistant, it's different than being a, uh, a coordinator. Um, you know, things to, to, to do different, um, as, as hard as year one has been, um, it's what was supposed to happen. You know, it was it was what was supposed to happen so that the growth could can take place. Uh, I think that how the season ended and everything that we went through, um, I think it was a reset for all of us just in terms of our appreciation for the opportunity, our appreciation for life, our appreciation for where we are. Uh, and that's going to motivate me to, to make sure that, you know, I keep the main thing the main thing. You know, still continue to coach the guys hard, but coach with a lot of love. Uh, also, you know, make sure that I'm conscious of, of, I guess, going back to how I started, uh, I think that I have to become a head coach, but treat it like my position group. So I have to be in tune with the body language. I have to be in tune, you know, with the temperament, uh, which is a little bit different. So I'm going to have to be more intentional uh, to a certain extent um, and be more present uh, on all phases. Of, uh, of of the team, offense, defense, and special team. And so then I'm going to have to delegate some of the day-to-day -day stuff that comes across my desk and uh, empower, you know, those that I put in place to be able to do it. And I think year one, you know, you're trying to get it the way that you want it. And with the transition, there was a combination of people that had been here, right, that were retained. And then I had a select few that came from where I came from. And then there were others that came from different working environments and so trying to get all of those individuals on the same page you know took a lot took a lot of work on my part right and so I also got to make sure that I don't allow that to take away from the time that I have with the players and being fully in tune with the with the guys uh, on the field so just big balancing act so that was probably harder than I thought it was going to be being able to manage all of the different things that you have to that you have to manage on a day to day, uh, but going forward, um, being able to empower the folks to handle some of the things that that I probably don't need to do as a head coach. But first year, you're trying to do all those things because you know you want to get things uh, the way that you want them. I could follow up on that. One of the things I remember from early in the year was you were furiously taking notes sometimes during the game on <laughs> operation, how everything's working. That's right. And there was a moment where you said you kind of delegated the note taking. That's right. Um, but I'm curious, operationally, what were some things when you reviewed that, okay, on game day, I like this, or on game day, we should switch this, moving guys, or whatever it was. Yeah, I think, you know, the biggest thing was from a special team standpoint is, is we learned, you know, just how to be more efficient from a special team standpoint. And then we also learned that, you know, there's 60 minutes in a game and you got a bunch of people that could easily get distracted. So we got to make sure that we maintain that focus so that we can, you know, operate the, the way that we need to operate. Um, you know, I felt good just with the, the travel aspect of things and, and how that how that went. I think that, you know, the intensity that, that we have to start uh, pregame warm-ups with, you know, is an area where we can improve. Uh, and I think that goes back to making sure the mindset is the way, the way it needs to be uh, coming out of the locker room. Uh, and I think, you know, Duke was, in, was, was one instance that I can look back to that we didn't have the right mindset, and that falls on me as the, as the head coach. That's my job to make sure uh, that the guys uh, mentally are where they need to be uh, at the start of the game. Um, you know, I think substitutions is always something, you know, that we can, that we can continue to work on. And each coach kind of, to kind of finding that balance. And I remember as the running back coach, you, you got three guys trying to figure out how to rotate them. And then you're also in a situation where you want to play the hot hand. So uh, I think positionally we can, we can improve there. I think, you know, offensively, uh, an area that we can, we can improve is, 
is making sure that, that we take you know, some of the coaching out of it and, and make sure that the players are able to, to execute it from a volume standpoint, if that, if that makes sense. That's an area where I know we can, uh, can improve. I think defensively, uh, we gotta, we got to improve the, the use of our depth uh, at times. Uh, as we got deep into the season, there were some guys that were playing too many snaps, and then there were some guys that didn't have enough snaps. Um, and so that's, that's operational-wise something that I got to do better in forcing that, you know, the guys that deserve to play, make sure that they're getting their reps. And if that means that it's a 90-10 split, make sure that the guy that deserves 10 gets the 10, right? And if it's 80-20, then we're, we're 80-20. And so those are things that, that I can, can do a better job of, of managing the staff uh, to get accomplished. Uh, <clears throat> Tony, I think the last time we talked to you, you were trying to, uh, I think you were getting ready to speak to Brian O'Connor about a plan for Jay Wolf Wolfelk. What, what did you come up with? Yep, so today's the day, and I tried to call uh, Coach O, uh, but I didn't get him, but no. So what, 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 what we started with is, is first and foremost, man, I, um, I believe Jay's got a tremendous future, both football and baseball, um, ahead of him. Obviously, I think it's a little bit more defined right now in baseball. So what I told Coach O is a, uh, until February 1st, you take him, he's yours, evaluate him, and then, then we'll figure out what it looks like. And, and really, that's the time to determine if he'll be a starter, he'll be a closer, because again, those, that changes our approach. Uh, because if he's one, then we'll have a little bit more access to him. If he's another, then you know, we're kinda, we have to be flexible because we don't know his exact schedule. So today uh, is the day, and I know Coach O and, and, and Coach Lamb and the pitching coach have, have been in conversation. Um, but today is kind of the deadline to determine where we feel like his role will be. And then from there, we'll determine the amount of actual balls he'll throw for us in spring ball. Uh, but the plan is to have him at every practice and all the meetings uh, in the mornings, and then he'll do baseball uh, in the evenings. And also being sensitive to, you know, he's not just a guy on the team, in my opinion. He's a guy that can contribute and help. Uh, and I want to make sure that, that he's able to do that at the same time he's in a quarterback battle. You know, we brought in a transfer, we got a freshman, and we got two uh, second-year guys uh, that, are, that are here that are going to compete. So he needs to be there. Uh, so we're going to get as much of the physical work as we can, but he'll get all the mental work uh, that he needs to be able to compete. Yep. The other thing, the, the ACC schedule came out this week. What do you think of your schedule? You know, uh, I, like, uh, I like the open date in the middle, right? Uh, but man, it's a it's it's a grind uh, all the way through. You know, we come out that we come out the gate and 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 we're gonna be tested. And that was a question that I got when I when I first got here about that game. And I'm like, hey, I got to play it. You know, if you're gonna test and, and measure what your program is, then you need to measure it against you know what is perceived to be you know one of the the better programs in the country. So we got a test, and then we got another test uh, at home, and then we're a test on the road. So every every game's gonna be a test. But I think when you look at it, uh, where the open date sits. Um, and then we got a couple of uh, we got a Friday night and a Thursday night game where you'll get you know at least an extra day uh, of rest. So so I like the structure with the open date. Um, I think there's some balance uh, in it, uh, but there's going to be you know some stretches where you know we're going to be tested uh, from a program standpoint. But overall, you know I thought it was was favorable uh, considering where the open date is and then how the games are placed uh, on the uh, on the schedule. And hopefully we'll you know we'll get a couple of uh, uh, we'll get a couple of night games at home. And then we won't have to play too many night games on the road because that's where it gets tough. You know, is when you have to play those night games on the road and when you travel, especially when you're traveling. You know, if you're traveling way up north or you're traveling way down south, uh, that's where it starts to take the toll. I don't know if there's any chance that Nick Jackson comes back, but assuming he's gone, uh, I don't think you brought in anybody at linebacker, at least in the transfer group. What about the returning group at that position? You feel pretty good about them. Well, I feel really good about Ahern coming back because he had a he had a decision and he, and he was you know probably leaning a little bit towards possibly moving on, but to get him back and his leadership and uh, playmaking ability and I, I felt like James Jackson made a lot of progress uh, this past season. Um, and then you have Stevie Bracey will be a guy that'll that'll get reps and Trey McDonald uh, as a second year guy now. Will, I'll be a little bit older, so I feel good um, just in terms of, of the depth that we have there. A little bit unproven, but we do have some, some leadership and some balance. And then we, we, we signed two uh, first-year guys that will show up that I think you know, could be, could be college-ready, at least one of them for sure, uh, be college-ready to help push there. So I feel good uh, about you know, where the depth is. Uh, we just got to do a good job this spring of, of getting some of those younger guys uh, ready to, uh, to step into to more significant roles.
But overall, I, I feel good about that group. As y'all are getting back into the swing of things right now and just a month out until spring practice, do you know what Mike Holland's availability will be this spring? Yeah, I'm proud of Mike, man. Really, really proud of Mike and, and just the, the, the perseverance that he showed um, to, to get back to where he is, to be in, uh, working out with the guys. Uh, not a ton of restrictions, still a little bit limited on some things, uh, but we're anticipating that you know, he could be, could be turned loose. Uh, but it'll be a situation where we make sure that we, uh, that we monitor it closely uh, and we do what's, what's best for Mike uh, in, his, uh, in his progression back. Have you been in contact at all with, with Nick Jackson? Is a return possible? Is he enrolled here? He's enrolled. You know, he's enrolled, so that, that gives you a chance. Uh, but, uh, but really haven't put a ton of pressure on him. And, you know, he was uh, uh, at the banquet. You know, he was voted a team captain and, and had a chance to see him. I know he's still going through his process of evaluating, uh, of evaluating schools. Uh, I know Coach Rudd and uh, Coach sent him, you know, keeping in contact with him as well. But it's not one of those situations. And when I look at Nick, right, you know, Nick is going to graduate from the University of Virginia. Um, and this is where I believe in the transfer portal from the standpoint of if a young man graduates from your institution, he's fulfilled his obligation, in my opinion. Uh, now, I'd love to see him come back. Uh, I think he can, uh, can do some things that can kind of put him up there. Uh, amongst the uh, uh, the greats in in school history, but at the end of the day, too, I understand uh, that he's earned the opportunity to look around uh, and see what else is out there. And um, you know, I don't think we're at that point yet. I know I'll, I'm not aware of him making a decision, um, but uh, that'll be a decision he'll have to make if he wants to come back. Love to have him back, uh, but at the same time, too, I respect uh, where he is uh, in this process. His his situation is a little different because he's older, graduated yep. all conference. There are a lot of kids in the transfer portal, not, not UVA, from, from all over the ACC, right. all over the country, who went into the transfer portal, are no longer on their school's rosters, aren't going to be practicing this spring, and aren't anywhere else. Um, as a coach and an educator, are you concerned at all about, I mean, guys going into that portal and, and kind of stuck in limbo? I, I definitely am, um, because uh, at the end of the day, why are we here? We're here for the young people. Um, and I reminded the staff yesterday in the staff meeting is, you know, the, the kids don't come here because we're here. We have a job because the student athletes come to the University of Virginia. Yes, we have to go recruit them, but at the end of the day, uh, that's the, the business that we're in, the people business of developing young people. And uh, obviously everybody's situation is different. And so, you, you know, you can't, you can't isolate. Uh, uh, you can isolate, but it's hard to, to paint with a broad brush, right? But when you see that there's thousands of kids uh, in the portal that gave up an opportunity to, to have their education paid for, had, gave up an opportunity to compete in a sport that they love, but more importantly, gave up their opportunity to be developed and to be challenged and to be grown. Um, it's, uh, it's a little bit you know, concerning, uh, disheartening, um, but at the same time, too, I, I get it that kids need an opportunity if the situation is not the best situation to be able to go somewhere. But I also feel like there's some social pressures out there that may have influenced some young people to make decisions you know, hastily, not knowing the full uh, implications of the, uh, of the decision. As you look ahead to spring practice, are there any <clears throat> excuse me, position changes you've made or are considering and any players you know now that will be limited or out because of, because yeah. of surgery or injuries? Yeah, so position changes. Uh, you know, I think you could, could see Lex Long uh, playing a little bit closer to the box. Um, not necessarily a wholesale position change uh, per se, but you know he's a guy that's got some versatility uh, to give us some added depth to that to that linebacker uh, room. If for for some reason we don't get the uh, the development that we need, um, I'm trying to think of anybody else position wise. I think we're I think we're holding steady. Oh, Hunter Stewart, Hunter Stewart. Oh, oh uh, you'll see more of him as an edge guy uh, with the uh, what we call our bandit position. Uh, playing that that boundary defensive end stand-up guy, um, he's he's done a good job too. He's put on some weight and he's excited about that new opportunity. Uh, so those are the the two uh, I'd say uh, position change type uh, deals that we have going on. Guys that'll be be limited. Uh, Noah Josie, uh, back surgery, so he'll be limited uh, this uh, this spring. You know, excited to see Foston get back out there um, and work with us. He's been been doing everything with the guys um, so far. Um, Dakota Twitty is still. You know, going to be out uh, this spring. Sue will be out uh, with the uh, with the pec injury. Chico will be out. Soldier, uh, Ahern will be out. Gaines will be down and limited. Jonas will be down and limited. All those are, are isolated shoulder uh, 
instances for Mui. Uh, same thing. He had a, a came back from break and and realized that you know it was a situation. He thought his shoulder was going to calm down. Came back and so uh, he'll uh, he'll be down for the uh, for the spring. Um, Houston Curry be a little bit limited. Found out two days ago that he had appendicitis. Uh, had to have his appendix out, but we anticipate he'll get back. And then you know Sackett just had a small procedure to clean up some some bone spurs in his ankle. Uh, so he'll be back at some point this spring uh, to uh, to compete. Mm -hmm. Last year, around this time, January was your first time out recruiting for Virginia. Now, one year later, you weren't as rushed. Last year, you had to kind of recruit so quickly with 22. Right. This one, you got to look ahead. How different was it being in the recruiting trail one year later with the Virginia logo? Right. So, so you know, the great thing is, is I'm really, really uh, proud of the coaches, uh, the staff, uh, and the young men because we had several guys that were committed, you know, prior to uh, how the season ended, and we only lost, you know, one commitment from a guy that we had committed. Uh, everybody else that was committed, you know, stuck with us, and so I was really, really proud, you know, of that. And then going out on the road, there's been there's been good reception, you know, in particular in the state of Virginia, uh, because there's a bigger presence, you know, with with UVA coming into to schools uh, consistently, you know, so it's not just a, a, a one hit wonder, uh, you know. I I challenge the coaches every year. I want on every school visited, you know, if if possible. Uh, so they're seeing more of us. Um, you know, in the state, and then I think some of the areas where we have relationships, it was good to get down into the Atlanta area uh, because of, of Coach Slade's prior relationships, and then some of the years that I and some of the other folks on the staff recruited. So the reception has been has been good. I, I think that uh, there's there's people that 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 see how uh, we're trying to build the program, and then there's relationships with people that know uh, what the intentions are to to build here. So it's been it's been positive. Now, still challenging. Right, still challenging when you get into some of those battles, uh, but you know time's going to come. You know time's going to come when when my shiny toys are are as shiny as everybody else's. Uh, there's still an element of that in recruiting, but from from the uh, from the the coach's standpoint on the road, it's been it's been good reception because uh, they appreciate, uh, especially here uh, in what we consider our our radius and our footprint. They're they're seeing a lot of of UVA. Um, and I think there's an appreciation too that the approach now is to is to build uh, through the through the draft, uh, focusing on on high school players and, and developing and being a developmental program, and then supplementing with the transfer portal, where where there's also a lot of coaches out there too that are frustrated because uh, a lot of the high school players are being overlooked uh, because of the ability to go um, get guys from the transfer portal. You sat a couple of times last spring and even into the summer, talked about guys who maybe had one foot in the water, one foot in, one out. As you go into year two, do you feel like most, if not all, of the guys are here now? They know what you're about. They know what the coaching staff is about. They're here because they want to be and they bought in. Right. And I think you saw, you know, towards the latter part of the season, uh, maybe not necessarily uh, on the field, but I could sense a turn. Uh, of the guys, you know, in particular, some of those guys that were one foot in, one foot out. I think it took them longer to, to realize uh, the the intention of of what I was was trying to do and how I was structuring things. Uh, but now that, that I think everybody that's come back, the guys that that came in mid year, you know, they wanted to be here. They came they came here with an understanding of what they were getting into. And then the guys coming back uh, had an understanding. And plus, uh, I believe that there was a, a greater motivation and investment. Uh, in understanding uh, what uh, what it is that they're playing for and why they're why they're coming back to UVA. So, again, as as I said earlier, the, the returns have been really positive uh, so so far. Man, the guys are upbeat. You walk in the locker room, man. There's smiles on their face. Man, they're working hard. Uh, we're not having as many of the just the the the, the incremental things. You know, the the showing up late and not having on the right gear. Uh, the guys have really bought into that, and I think they understand that. That where we want to go, it's going to take you know intensity and attention to detail. Kind of going off that last time, you when you were talking about Tony Musket, you said he kind of chip, brings a chip in, but this is a program that has a chip on his shoulder like already, so it was a good fit. What about this program has a chip on his shoulder? Is it you know, just how last year ended? Just kind of how the year went? Kind of where do you find that chip? Right, I, I think from a from a program standpoint, uh, I think that that there's a chip because they say we can't. Right, because of the academics or, or whatever reason that you that you want to say, I think just from a program standpoint, you you have that, um, and I think the guys need to understand that. I think um, you know Tony Musket in particular is moving up a level, uh, so he has a, has a chip uh, on his shoulder, and 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 to be honest, 
we got a lot to prove. So we got we got a big chip uh, on our on our shoulder. And at the end of the day, right, the work has to get done, right. And and we have to prepare, you know, to move to continue to move forward. And so, for me, I've always had a chip on my shoulder, right. Just just background, uh, wanting to 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 prove not necessarily everybody wrong, but to prove myself right in what I what I believe. And so I think. That'll start with, with me and getting the guys to, to understand, too. And several of these guys, they weren't recruited by some of the schools uh, that they get to play against. Uh, so there's a natural chip uh, on your shoulder. Uh, but I think it's a chip, but really a combination of appreciation um, and then responsibility uh, and understanding that, that it's bigger than you and you play for something bigger than yourself. And you know those are some of the things that, that as a staff and as a program, we got to change our mindset if we're going to accomplish and first, be consistent enough to accomplish the things that we desire to accomplish a big picture as a program. Uh, the um, the legacy patches yep. that you unveiled at the bank. Yep. What what's the plan for those this year and going? Yeah, so so obviously there's there's still uh, a lot of discussion. There's a, there's a uh, there's a group that was uh, assembled uh, to talk about how we're going to continue to honor uh, the lives of uh, Lavelle, Devin, and Deshaun uh, going forward. Uh, but for me, the patch was was just about immediately you know, showing uh, uh, our commitment to their legacies going forward. And so the plan with the, with the patch is um, whenever the jersey's on the field, you know, those guys are going to be remembered. They're going to be honored. And so uh, the individual jersey numbers will, will don that patch. Uh, obviously, there'll be, there'll be different tributes that we'll have throughout the year and, and in the future. Uh, when other things will be done, but the, with the patch was was something that immediately I wanted to to do uh, to honor the families, to honor the young men, and then also, you know, to make sure that the that the players, you know, constantly understand uh, not just the legacies of those three, but you know, you never know when your legacy is going to come into play, right? We all work our whole lives, right, to create a legacy, to build a legacy, and we never know when that time is going to come when that legacy kicks in. And so, it's just a subtle reminder to the guys, but then also. A, a visible public reminder to everybody else uh, of the lives that were um, that were taken from us uh, um, tragically. Yep. No, no, the the one the one fifteen forty one, and I think. Uh, yep. So this this is this is the the patch that that you'll see more of this on the back of the helmet that everybody will have something similar to that, and then there's an individual patch for the number one jersey, whether it's worn on offense or defense, doesn't matter which player. Uh, where's it? Uh, so those those three jerseys will have an individual patch, and then we'll have decals on the back of our helmet. And then obviously there's discussion of if there's a game where you where you put a patch. And then for the seniors, because the seniors won't have a chance to 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 put on the jersey again, one of their parting gifts at our banquet is on their jersey. There's a patch that has all three of those, but that uh, that's not going to be the the prominent one that's put on the uh, on the individual jerseys. Let me follow up on that. Are, have you seen like an outpouring of guys wanting to wear those numbers? Did guys not feel comfortable wearing those? What, what's been? Yeah, we we have we haven't had a ton of ton of discussion uh, yet. We're still trying to put some parameters on what the qualifications are to wear those to wear those jersey numbers uh, going forward. Uh, and I think it's still a little too soon uh, for the guys in the locker room um, to to make that decision. What was your reaction to? Brennan transferring, Brennan transferring within the league, Brennan popping up on your schedule in such a prominent yeah. position. What's your thoughts on all that? You know, it's, it's a lot like Nick's situation. Uh, you know, Brennan uh, graduated, man, he gave uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears uh, to this university. And so, you know, he has every right to make that decision, and I support him in wanting to make that decision. And, uh, and I know he was kind of toggling between going pro and, and seeing what other opportunities were out there, and he's earned that right to, uh, to, to see those opportunities. So I'm happy for him. And, and obviously, it'll probably be some emotion for both sides when, uh, when that game comes on the 22nd. Uh, but once the, once, the, uh, once the whistle blows, he'll be a competitor. You know, just like any other other young man, and that's really kind of the space that we're in. To be honest with you, when you start talking about this transfer portal, you know, because then the the, the flip side is when we play North Carolina, we got Cam Kelly, right? May not have been the quarterback, but we got a guy. Um, just like when we played North Carolina last year, Noah was over there. You know, so it's kind of the space that we're in. Um, but but one, I'm just uh, I'm excited for him that he graduated, he finished, uh, and he earned that opportunity to make that decision. And at the end of the day. 
um, as, as much as, as you would not like to see it, you can't really be upset about it, to be honest with you. It's just a, it's just a space that we live in. And so there's, I don't take it personal. I don't believe anybody in our, in our facility takes it personal. I know the players don't take it personal. It's just kind of the space uh, that we're in. And then we'll compete. And then after that game is over, then we'll go back to the, to the relationships that we got. You alluded to facilities yep. earlier. As you start putting together the 24 recruiting class, high school guys and freshmen, they will come in and be in the new building their first year here. Uh, what impact do you think that will have, I guess, in recruiting the next group as that takes shape? Right. I think, I think you know, a, a couple of things. Now, now you're, you're, you got a little bit of shine to you. And, I mean, let's just be transparent with this day and age in, in recruiting. Uh, and I see you over there. You, you deal with recruiting, so you know. The guys like shiny stuff, right? For them, that's not necessarily the – uh, ultimate decision maker, but for them, it, it equates the commitment of the program. You know, when you when you've committed to facilities, when you got nice things to show them, and they equate that with you know being taken care of. You know, while they while they come to school, and so it's important to have that. But for me, what's more important is the people and the environment that we have inside the facility. So, well, what I think you'll see is you'll see it'll it'll attract more uh, individuals to want to come see. Uh, what what UVA has going on, and then my hope is that when we get those guys here, uh, what's inside the building, the quality of the people, the quality of the players will help to to cipher through which ones, you know, truly you know want to come to UVA for the right reasons and not just because you have a uh, have a nice building. Uh, so it's it's important. It's extremely important. Um, and, but it's more important, I, I believe, that we have the right uh, processes and people in place uh, to make it as effective as it could possibly be. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, you got to take baby steps. But, but also, too, I think, I think, you know, you bring that up. You know, one of the things is uh, I think you got to be strategic uh, when, you're, when you're navigating this space in college football. And you do things that fit your program and fit your institution. Um, so uh, I know they got 100 yards of wellness. They got the media center. And, you know, that's where their program is, right? Um, and, you know, we're striving to, to get better, but at the end of the day, is that the right thing for UVA? I want to make sure that we get the right things, you know, for UVA uh, in the future uh, to make us uh, the best we can be because our environment, our, our, our grounds, you know, Charlottesville is different uh, than other places, and I think it's important that, that if you want to, you know, have a healthy program, that you do things that fit your program. Now, you got to somewhat keep up with the Joneses, right? But you don't have to have exactly what the Joneses had. You need to have what fits UVA uh, to keep uh, people attracted to UVA for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. Hugh Lawlin, is he part of the guys recruiting staff now? Yeah, so he's, he's so, man, unfortunate for Hugh. Uh, obviously, he was battling hard to, to be able to continue his football career, but just was having too many, you know, too many problems uh, medically uh, to where the, the doctors just felt like the best thing for him to do is to, is to medically, you know, essentially retire. Uh, but for me, uh, that happens, right? Unfortunately, it's a very, very violent game, uh, and guys' careers, you know, get cut short, and you hate to see it. Uh, but for me, when that happens, I still want guys to be a part uh, of the program, um, whether it's student coach, whether it's working in recruiting, working in the weight room, still want them to be involved. I don't want them to feel like just because they can no longer play that they're, they're not a part of this program. So talking to him, you know, he, he, he said, hey, I want to go into recruiting. So he works with the recruiting staff and, and helps out and helps us out uh, on visits and gives a great perspective too. He's able to give a perspective uh, to families and to young men that not many of us can give because of the experiences that he's had uh, with the game. That, that was Hugh Laughlin. Um, do you want to mention your new graduate assistant? Who's that? Are oh, you talking about Maverick? Yeah. Uh, Maverick Morris. Uh, Maverick Morris is a is a young man that from South Georgia that played uh, that played at Clemson, uh, played every spot but center. Uh, was a guy that was did whatever you need, and then went down to La Monroe uh, as the OL coach with um with uh, with Coach Bowden, who was was a, a kind of a volunteer coach for a couple of years on staff at Clemson, and so just excited when uh, when Jay Jay Guillermo. Um, who was our GA, got an opportunity to go become the offensive line coach at East Tennessee State. Uh, I was able to, to kind of lure Maverick away to come on back and, and reunite and, and help us uh, alongside Terry with the, uh, with the offensive line. 